and it's recording. Sweet. So last time, uh, definitely talked about this guy, right? And it was definitely all about composition. Uh, we learned that we can draw it basically all right here first and then just transfer it to Illustrator, right? We can even set up our pages. Arguably, I could even bring in my scanned image, right? And, and add a little bit more to it. I could start making a hybrid situation where maybe I didn't finish a few things on that analog drawing so I can erase the analog part that I don't like and I can add digital lines to it. In fact, starting to blend them between this sort of analog and digital realm. And we start to touch upon that, at least in my, my graphics three. Um, however, for today, I just wanna introduce Photoshop and at least how we can use it to fix some of the drawings so that when we print them out, they don't get worse, right? Because that's probably the worst thing that can happen is that you get to a drawing uh, that you did so well in analog and it's nice and it's kind of got this sheen to it because of the nice uh, graphite that's on it. It's, it's got some really nice analog qualities. However, the digital realm has a, a great way of reprinting stuff and, and somehow compressing it to make it look worse. So in ways, um, you'll definitely always use this tutorial. Maybe. Uh, not specifically this video, um, but hopefully it'll become apparent that you know we use this all the time to develop and strengthen our images. Anyway, first thing I, I, I noticed is actually on the board, um, the other teacher was basically saying Rhino to Photoshop. I would say that's a big no, right? Because one is a vector program and one is a raster program. And I'll, I'll kind of show you uh, what that kind of means. However, it's in my personal opinion that I drag my illustrator lines directly to Photoshop. And I, I did want to introduce that as well as what we're doing. So kind of just to continue what we were doing last time. And yeah, I think my screen is losing it. It's starting to flash. I'm going to go ahead and hit copy. So command C on the windows, it'll be control C. And I'm going to go ahead and open up Photoshop. Correct. That, that, I think, is the correct workflow. I mean, don't get me wrong. Technically, you can do the exact same thing. You can export as DWG. You can now open a DWG in Photoshop, but that wasn't always the case, right? Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, you'll, you'll see exactly what happens. It's going to turn it into a rasterized line, and you'll immediately see why it's more important to have a rasterized line in Illustrator. So let's go ahead and open it up. Thought I was. My bad. And we probably don't need Rhino anymore today. Sweet. All right, so we got some Photoshop. So first thing I wanted to show you is that, well, you can take lines directly from Illustrator. So let's go ahead and do that really quick first. Ignore. Let's go ahead and make a new file just like any other program. And you'll notice it really has the same uh, user interface as Illustrator. And they're all really fairly close. In fact, sometimes it's confusing on the Mac. They look the exact same. It, even the tools are sometimes the exact same icons. So be a little careful of that. Um, I don't work in pixels. Definitely work in inches. And just to kind of get it, um, in our case, I can't use separate artboards in Photoshop. Um, so I need to actually overall do the entire thing. So 72 inches by a height of 36. With a resolution usually that matches the image that I'm throwing in there. So in my case, well, if I'm working on a 300 DPI, I'm gonna make sure that well, the project is also in 300 DPI. Now, don't get me wrong, I can go higher, but lower it gets worse. Obviously, don't get me wrong guys, I used to do 450 all the time, and I was like, why is my computer so slow? But my, my graphics look so good, but is there any way to get my computer faster? And my teacher just looked at me like, you're an idiot. You're working at 450 DPI in the year 2010. It's, it's not possible on a laptop, right? Uh, but I was all about quality, all about perfection, but just be aware that your computer, the higher the DPI, the more processing it has to go through, right? Anyway. So in our case, 300 is pretty safe and for most 2024 computers. Looking pretty good. However, I think I got the measurement wrong. I think it's 24 plus 24. Not a big deal. 
sometimes I like messing up that way I can show you how to fix it you'll go to image canvas size right and of course just change your width so in my case I believe it's 48 actually proceed and that's looking a lot more like two boards right I can use the same thing the space bar to pan I can use the plus sign and minus sign to zoom in and zoom out so again a lot of the same interfaces and even really the same commands I can of course right click and switch it to inches and good to go now what's nice is I already did a copy paste kind of thing so all I have to do is command V as in Verret and paste it now this is where it kind of gets specific and kind of nice Photoshop did not used to do this I told you guys about the first Photoshop I worked in was you know Windows 98 um, and it's definitely changed a lot since then but we're gonna bring it in as a smart object and you'll see immediately what that does well since we have the same canvas size voila all I have to do is press enter and it's gonna turn it into a raster now what did that do it, it well Vered it looks really good in fact it looks the exact same well if I zoom in onto one of those lines especially a diagonal line I'll immediately start to see the problem. It's no longer really a line, right? In fact, it's it's a Cartesian plane. It's a rasterized system. And you better believe that it's going to print out that fuzzy line too. Right? So be very careful. That 300 DPI um, can be quite stringent on lines, especially at this scale. Now, honestly, on a portfolio, it wouldn't be so bad, right? you're never going to get that close to it and arguably yeah the paper's never going to be this big right but hopefully I'm getting to the point that it does pixelate your line so uh, do be aware of that however I have mostly straight and vertical lines so it's not going to be, become super apparent in this drawing in fact you'll notice that well the horizontal lines yeah, they're still straight they're not pixelated well kinda there's like two lines in there one's black and one's gray right but again like not a perfect line right anyway just want to throw that out there yes sir so if I'm getting your question correctly in in doing this transfer to Photoshop does it all become one piece yes and sometimes that's really unfortunate right especially if you maybe haven't dialed in the line weights or, or things like that don't get me wrong none of you should have to do this for your project with me right I mean maybe some of you guys want to go above and beyond and try the hybrid process kind of do this analog slash digital thing you're more than welcome to right however really this next part I just kind of wanted to cover it so I can so make some points right that I mean, don't get me wrong, I like Rhino to Photoshop, but Illustrator to Photoshop makes a lot more sense because I can avoid color changes. I can get all the line weights in Illustrator first. I can dial in the text. I can get a lot of stuff, right? Um, that arguably Photoshop doesn't do text, by the way, right? Because of this exact pixelated raster program. Anyway, um, just want to throw it out there because I struggled for years. Like, why is my text shit, you know? Um, and nobody ever really told me or was even aware of what I was doing and of course doing everything in Photoshop little did I know Illustrator was a better tool for lines and Photoshop was a better tool for images so again I just want to give you guys a good foundation um, but it's not bad because well from here there's a lot I can do with these lines especially as a smart object and you'll see that it immediately comes in as one sort of smart layer in fact we still have our layers in Photoshop. You'll see that if I turn off the background, the lines are still there, right? They're, they're almost like this physical thing that, well, I just can't manipulate the line weights or colors. In fact, you know, it, it, as you can see, it really did bring in all the colors that I forgot to change in Illustrator. So don't get me wrong, I got ahead of myself even for today's tutorial. I should have, of course, changed all my line weights and dialed some things in before actually stepping in and doing this process. However, you can start to manipulate it actually quite nicely. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my background. In fact, one of my rules of thumb, just because the background, you'll notice by default it's locked and kind of gets all crazy. I'll unlock it and just kind of make it a white background layer. That way it's, it's really a part of my drawing. It doesn't start messing with things and, and whatnot. 
However, what's really nice is our magic wand tool or the letter W as in walrus, right? And you'll notice it's right here. You can also right click on tools and see that, well, there's multiple tools or sub tools within a primary tool. So in our case, it's part of the magic wand tool. And as long as you're on the layer, so it actually comes in as a vector smart object, but I'm gonna call it my, I don't know, lines. As long as I'm on that layer, I can select anything within those boxes, instantly making this like a coloring book. You guys know what I'm saying? Did the potential hit yet? Right? I can now basically hatch, right? And it still reads it as a vector program. Again, that is where I find this to be extremely useful. Why, why I would even take lines into Photoshop is of course because, well, I was just gonna use it as some sort of template anyway. So I kinda wanna show you what I mean by that. Obviously, I don't need to really manipulate the lines. They're already set, they're already good. I would have to maybe change their color. I don't really wanna show you guys that today. However, if you wanna look into it, it's under image, adjustments, and replace color, which is right there. So you can definitely write that one down or keep good note of it. Uh, but in my case, um, I want to show you maybe how to introduce something or add something um, to your analog drawing. So again, I just wanted to point out that yeah, you could do this with digital lines too, but let's go actually and take a step back uh, to what I actually wanted to show you guys today. So anyway, definitely some potential there. And you can do this as much with digital lines as analog lines, as long as the analog lines are closed as we'll find out. So let's go ahead and close that. Don't really need to save it. Let's go ahead and make a new one. In my case, I would actually match the size of maybe the drawing that I got from uh, Kathea or whatever I scanned. Um, and to be honest, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, this is actually the really easy part. So I'm just gonna go to File, Automate, and the last one, Photo Merge. So it's a very um, scripted process. Fairly easy, I'm just gonna put my scans in here. So I'm gonna hit Browse. Make sure that I get my scans. Make sure that you get all of them and no, they don't have to be in any particular order, but they will have to overlap each other, right? That'll be a huge problem if it's not and we'll find out if I did it correct as well. For the most part, you can hit automatic. Um, however, if you, were, if you wanted to make a really big sphere image of Google Maps, it's really cool because it, you can like unwrap them and make them all flat. It's really, it's really nice. Um, but yeah, this is of course how they do that. Um, also, if you have a 360 camera, uh, you're probably quite familiar with this. Anyway, let's go ahead and press OK. Let it do its magic. It's essentially going to take all three of those images and rotate them, manipulate them until they actually match each other. Now, before 2004, we would have to do this manually, which was hilarious. Can you imagine? We'd like, sit there for days. And if you didn't even scan it right, it was never going to match, right? Um, and wow, now it does it in less than 20 seconds. So that's looking pretty good. And as you can see from the layers, you can kind of start to tell what it took and what it stitched together. And it's just an overall really great tool that um, doesn't really just for architecture, but definitely worth noting. So I'm gonna take all my layers, I'm gonna go ahead and flatten them. Flattening basically just turns it all into one layer. And there's actually multiple ways. In fact, all three of these will do that. It's kind of funny. Uh, so if I flatten the image, you'll see that it creates that white background. It, it really stitched them all together. And as you can see, it's all, it's all one piece. In my case, um, I still wanna further manipulate it. So I'm gonna hold shift on the crop tool and I'm gonna dial it in, right? Maybe I don't need all that you know, sort of extra frills or sort of the edges of the paper, things like that. Oh, maybe I do, because I don't wanna chop off some bits. That's looking pretty good. Obviously, I, I don't want to keep that. And we'll get to the edge of the paper. What's pretty nice about the scanner, and especially this one, is it scans to true size. So um, actually, this one says about 15 inches. I bet you that piece of paper is exactly 15 inches. Is that right, Kathy? Probably. Um, but what's nice is it's going to dial it into the exact size that it was scanned. I can't tell you enough. Like, again, in 2004, this was not the case. You had to do a lot of calculations. Um, so it, it's so nice to see that it's gotten uh, somewhat easier. Um, but there's a lot we could do here as well. For instance, um, Kathea might not like 
that you know it's really close to the top edge and she might want to actually just move all of them in general so in my case I'm gonna take my select tool I'm gonna to make sure that I get just the piece that I want to move I'm gonna cut it so command um, command X right it's gonna create a black box in my case that's because well I have it set to a black background so if I if I did that again on white it's gonna turn it into a white background just be aware that you might be like oh man I made a big red box well that's because you have your color set to red right so great got to show that I'm gonna go ahead and paste it again and put it in a spot that maybe I want it more right maybe I want to align something oh can I do the same thing as illustrator yep I can grab tools and I can further align some things. Again, really useful if I'm trying to rotate this in any way. So I can do Command T as in transform. And I, I can even further manipulate it. Maybe it's maybe it's just a little off, you know? Maybe, I mean, have you guys ever done that? You did an entire drawing, you notice like the paper's like slightly crooked and you're like, oh my God, what was I thinking? I'm gonna have to do this all over again. Or I could take it into Photoshop and of course manipulate it. So one of the first things we could do is straighten lines. Right, I mean, we can really dial it in where all of her straight lines are gonna match up to a straight, wonderful vertical grid. Right? We can do the same thing with our horizontal lines. I can hold shift to keep things straight. Uh, and really overall, it's a lot like the Adobe Suite. However, I might wanna go a step further, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, this is looking pretty good and it scanned really well. In fact, those are the kind of things I wanna keep Right, those kind of lines, those slight construction lines that you probably can't see so much on a projector. However, overall, there might just be something that you don't want. You know, maybe you don't want these little pieces or kind of the fuzzy sort of noise is what that's normally referred to as. So there are a couple things that we can do. The first is Command M as in mother. And that's gonna bring up your curves. Another way to find it is actually through image adjustments and it's gonna be in their curves. Uh, let's close it real quick, just so you can see it. Image, adjustments, and of course curves. However, um, I did wanna mention, just in case you accidentally scanned it in some crazy format, and you're like, sir, if I go to image and I go to adjustments, all of these are grayed out. Why? That's usually because of your mode, right? So do make sure that your mode is in some sort of RGB or CYNK and is of course at least eight bits, right? Very often, sometimes your image, especially if it comes from an internet source, it'll be at 32 bits, and your computer just can't handle that. So it'll just show up black or just not at all. Um, so be aware that this definitely makes a, a big effect on the way an image is read by the computer. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into the science, but um, it's all in bits, anyway. Um, so let's go ahead and use curves. So adjustments, curves, and I usually hit automatic just to kind of see what it produces. Not a lot of change. You probably just saw it get a little brighter. Maybe nothing at all actually on the projector. Um, but we do have some tools with this. So you'll see that there's a black eyedropper tool, a white eyedropper tool, and to be completely fair, I still have yet to know what the middle eyedropper does. Um, you're welcome to test it out, but I really haven't seen it do much besides sort of give us a gray point. Anyway, I haven't really found it quite useful. But if I choose the black eyedropper tool, I want to click on the darkest element of my lines, right? And of course, show you why. If I accidentally click on the white, oh, shh, right? Obviously, it's going to turn everything uh, sort of negative and in on itself, and definitely not what I wanted to produce. So I'm going to hit Command Undo. I'm going to use the black eyedropper tool again, and I'm going to make sure to click on something black or in my case, very dark. You'll see if I accidentally choose a gray line. Oh, see if I can get it. Oh, of course I have to actually hit the tool. You'll see that it immediately makes that little gray line and everything around it also to match that black color. Also not what I want, but I do want to kind of go for these weird yellowy spots. You guys see how it's kind of yellowy? Maybe not so much on the projector. Again, hopefully you'll see it more in the recording. But I definitely want to click on those yellows because I, I want black and white-ish. I don't really want yellows. That, of course, comes from the paper and the reflections of things. 
Uh, so the more we know about this drawing, and I also don't want to get rid of my wonderful creativeness, my construction lines, my humanness to it, but I might want to get rid of some of the noise. So I'm going to use my white eyedropper tool, and I'm going to try to find the lightest noise that I can, and that, that's looking pretty close to light noise. You can barely even see it in the projector. I'm going to click on that, voila, just starts to really clean up. And as you can see, it still looks like an analog drawing. But what's nice is now there's the noise is gone and the contrast of the lines are nice and thick. That means the, the you know, the printer is going to avoid the white space and, and keep it white. And now it's just going to focus its ink on the actual line, which is important, right? We're basically telling the printer essentially what to do with our image. That alone will make your image stand out night and day, right? However, we can take it a step further. I could introduce levels or command L, as in loser. I don't know. I can't think of another L. But you can you can definitely manipulate the contrast of your lines as well, and I find that pretty useful, especially if I'm doing some sort of hybrid and I really want to make it look like I went from an analog to a digital drawing. And again, this is something that I can take into Rhino, guys. I can erase the roof and I can I can redraw it if I wanted to. I can make this sort of hybrid drawing. To where I could even do an exploded axon of three different ideas of roofs that I came up with, you know, to kind of, to really expand on the communication of things. Again, not a requirement, just, I, I, want, I want to also show you the potential of using these. Uh, but yeah, that's looking pretty good. I could change the white point as well, to really darken the lines. Obviously, there's a point of where it's too much. And constantly, I'm, I'm going back and forth between zooming in. And yeah, you know, that noise is pretty bad. You definitely don't want any of that. So, of course, adjust accordingly. But you do want some fuzz. I mean, again, you don't want to suddenly turn it into a computer drawing. You want it to have this, this human quality to it. But really, for the extent, that is what I wanted to show you today, at least in terms of Photoshop. The the next about 20 minutes is, is really extra. It's definitely more, more of a bonus. It's um, maybe you're not being challenged enough with this project yet. You really haven't maybe learned a whole lot new. Uh, so maybe this is actually a step in kind of a newer direction and, and of course some potential with it. Um, but we can definitely add to this drawing and we can take away. So, I don't know, she might be like, well, you know, I did a lot better um, and my date's wrong or, you know, something about the text is just off. Um, you can always go back, right, take it and erase it so I can use the letter E and just like blow it away. Oh, of course I gotta be on the right layer. So, you'll notice if you're not erasing the layer, it won't erase anything because, well, what you're trying to erase isn't on that layer. And like I was saying before, the background automatically locks, so do keep that in mind, and it's part of our background. A couple ways to get rid of this. I like to use a select tool, just so I don't accidentally delete anything. And what I like about it is it'll keep it sort of in this selection. So if I hit E for erase, I can also control the eraser size. As you can see, mine is ginormous. And it looks like the tools have kind of changed as well. In my case, you can either, it, it sort of brings up this like, you're probably familiar with it. It brings up like a little tool set. I'm not exactly familiar with it. Let's see what that button does. Not what I want, that's what. What about that one? Eh, cancel. I guess that's a transform button, that's kind of cool. Remove background tool. That could be tricky. They're trying to implicate AI into this, and I mean, it's cool, but kind of just in the way right now. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, take Professor Tunks. He definitely uses it in his Photoshop really well. Definitely exciting to, to kind of see somebody using it so well. But yeah, I just don't use it entirely so much. I'm just gonna erase. It's just easier to me, and I can, of course, flatten this to make it a, you know, a white background. So in my case, flatten image, sweet, right? So maybe I actually wanna do some sort of ground relationship. I, I wanna show this, this guy on the ground or at least kind of manipulate, um, you know, it's just kind of floating in the air, if you will. So uh, there's a couple things I can do, 
right? So in my case, well, I don't want to sit here and kind of trace the whole thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you really do have to do that. But in my case, I really need the background. All right, so how could I do that? Well, I'm going to use my magic wand tool or the letter W. And I'm going to try and get everything in here. Actually, it's quite revealing. Some of the stuff that I didn't erase or kind of got left behind. So I'm going to go ahead and erase those first. I'm going to hit the letter E. Usually you can right click and it'll actually change the diameter size. Uh, let me see why. Eraser tool. Let me get on essentials. Oh, I am on essentials. What? Anyway, my tools are a bit messed up. Usually you can change the size quite easily. Oh, there it is. Yeah, usually if you right click, this pops up, but I guess it's changed locations. That's okay. But we can control the amount that it erases. I usually choose 100%. And obviously the pixel size. And as you can see, quite different. Usually, I don't mind it really being a big size. Um, it's a little easier. And as you can see, it's going to erase everything except for what I selected. So be careful. Edit undo. But in my case, I want to get the edges because I saw that there was kind of some anomalies out out in space. I'm going to go ahead and deselect. I can barely see them. Probably can't even see them on the projector. I look like a crazy person erasing nothing. That's okay. But I really want to add some sort of ground or grounding position. I mean, obviously, at this angle, I can't really show the sky. So I'll show the ground. Magic eraser tool. Or sorry, magic wand tool really got the entire outside of it and you can kind of see if you zoom in there's kind of what they used to call the ant line and so this little moving line it used to move a lot more anyway let's take it and let's brush in something else all right so i'm going to take a color of my choice uh, just something sort of light and gray scaled and give it a ground you'll see that i kind of brush it in just like really any other any other program maybe maybe the more that I actually put in the darker that it gets it starts to give it a, a nice little highlight and right now it's kind of just kind of a fuzzy end you know so maybe I give that something a little bit more definitive so in my case I'm gonna use my lasso tool one of my favorite tools for sure and I want to subtract from some of some of my piece so don't get me wrong, I need to cancel that real quick. I need to keep my selection, and I want to subtract from my selection. So I'm actually going to hold, um, in my case, Option on the Mac, and Alt on, on Windows. And that's to minus something from your selection. So in my case, I'm holding it, and you'll see that what I'm going to do is pretty simple. I'm going to match the lines that, of course, Kathia made. Try and match the angles. It's kind of a weird situation there, definitely. And I just want to get rid of sort of everything that I don't need. So it kept that selection. So what's really nice about that is now if I hit brush, well, it's going to stay in that selection. In fact, if I get the select tool, right click. Oh, I don't want to move it. probably in here. Select inverse is definitely what you want. That looks like it's going to select the inverse. Sweet. And oh, thank goodness for, for that. Obviously I don't want to get my lines, but for the sake of tutorial I'm going for speed right now. So I'd probably want to zoom in and, and dial those in. Obviously, you don't want to leave gigantic circles. Hey, okay, now my tool is working. And there's a lot we can do. We can hold shift here. We can we can make perfectly straight cuts and things like that. To be honest, sometimes, honestly, that amount of color, you're never going to see it printed. However, you'll always kind of know it's there. So, But again, a nice little touch to ground it. And you might think, oh, man, I just did all that work and I don't even like it right can I change the color can I do something else things like that 
Absolutely. So I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to copy that of which I just did. I've got to copy it from my background layer, so I'm going to copy. I'm going to paste it into my layer 1. It's going to look like absolutely nothing happened, or it's just actually going to make a new layer. That's fine, too. And as you can see, definitely there. But yeah. Anyway, just kind of want to throw that in there. You can still, of course, manipulate a analog drawing in a digital way. And, of course, like we did at the beginning, sort of vice versa, right? Lastly, I think it actually works best on some sort of elevation, right? Because, well, I can use those lasso tools and I can really start to show the sky, the background, and things like that. So don't get me wrong, I'm going to kind of show it in here, even though it'll be a very faux situation. Please do not add the sky to your axons, right? Why? Because they're looking at the ground. This is just for tutorial, right? And at least to show you how to achieve it. Really, it's the exact same thing. Just like we added something to the ground, except in our case, we need an image. So let's go to Google. Sweet. Let's look up sky. And really, the best word that you can type is texture or material. Now, I know sky is not a material, but it, it produces at least better results that kind of have these forced uh, perspective situations. Now, are elevations perspectives? No. So, in fact, what you want is actually something a little bit more flat. Now, if I was adding sky to my two-point perspective, then would I want a two-point clouds? Hell yeah, because they're going to be going down to a horizon. In fact, I'll even want to kind of line up my clouds so that they go down towards the horizon, right? However, for something of an elevation, I'll probably choose something a little bit more flat, right? To be honest, I mean, why, why not? Sunsets are great. People love sunsets and sunrises. Um, so might as well use something like that as well. Anyway, word to the wise, the best thing that you can do is not click on the picture because you're going to find a site like this, right? You also don't want the thumbnail. So you definitely want to right click on the thumbnail and open the image in a new tab. What's nice about that is it'll bring it to the original image that it's referencing, right? This is the one that you want to right click on and of course save. Again, a lot of this I'm going to go over sort of the beginning of graphics 3. But just in case, you know, you're not being challenged enough, you can definitely continue. We'll go ahead and save that to my desktop, somewhere where you can find it. And let's get some sky in there. In fact, let's imagine that Kathia's roof is actually pure reflective glass and that we'll see the sky in the reflection. That's actually kind of cool and a little bit more realistic just because we're not going to see the sky. Um, and I'd rather make a, um, a more factual drawing than not. Anyway, so let's make sure I have the right lines. Um, I may even need to sort of call this my lines. And I guess I don't really need those. I accidentally flattened it. And keep in mind, you can't undo a flatten. I mean, you can undo it immediately, but you can't like spread the layers back out. So just be aware of that. Uh, hopefully this tutorial will make us very aware of that. But I think in this case, the best thing I can do is a magic wand tool. So I just, again, I'm just sort of imagining that this is glass. Um, it's probably not, right? But Again, I can do the exact same things I did with the vector lines. I can use my magic wand tool and, and fine tune and get those little pieces that I eventually want to change or turn into another color. So in my case, I do want to definitely separate it and turn it into glass. So I'll make a glass layer. And in fact, what I draw next will be on that glass layer, even though it came from my lines. And don't get me wrong, uh, I kind of just have a color to kind of separate some things and I don't know I think things look nice when they kind of have like a white glistening reflection to it right sort of darker in the corners something a little bit more reminiscent of actual glass if you ever take a look at glass and the reflection of it it's definitely a little darker in its corners and of course I got this from Bob Ross you know his vignettes his corners can't really tell so much in actually the projector but Again, I want to give it that human flair. After all, it is all digital and it will look digital. 
So the more anomalies, uh, mistakes, quote unquote, I can add to it, the more realistic it's going to appear. What's nice is it comes from an analog drawing, so it's going to look, you know, pretty analog in general. Uh, but that's looking pretty good. And what's nice is now it's a separate piece. I no longer have to get that piece again. So I can do Command D and deselect it, and now introduce my sky. So now I can go to File, Place Embedded, and I'm essentially going to get that sky image that we just got. So we'll get the sky, looking pretty sweet. Obviously it's going to be the most epic reflection ever. It's probably going to be increased in scale, and I really only probably need a portion of it. So not to get too fancy. Uh, let's give it some transparency so I can see my lines again. Oh, we have to do it over here. That's okay. But yeah, now we can at least see what's going on and start to, well, maybe line up the clouds a little bit. For instance, well, I want to transform this. I'm going to use my Option key to, of course, uh, scale things. I can use, um, sorry, the Command key in Mac or the Control key. And I can really change the angle of the image, right? Because I may want to maybe just match the angle of my architecture. I mean, that would make a lot of sense, right? Especially if I was trying to dial in the angle and I really wanted to get it. Probably don't need this much of the image, but again, it's for the sake of tutorial. So I'll kind of line it up, just kind of show you what it does. But voila, I didn't have to calculate or think about oh, what kind of way is the angle of light going to really show and I needed to compress the image. It's going to do all those things kind of naturally for me. However, I don't need this much red in my glass, so I'll kind of get rid of that a little bit. And press enter. From here, I just need the glass. So I'm going to hit W. And it's going to select everything for me. I'm going to go back to the sky. And basically erase what I don't need. So, well, I need to right click and select the inverse. And erase what I don't need in this. Uh, but I want to erase it from the sky. So. It's going to go, wait a minute, it's not a smart object yet. And that's because it came from the internet. Just press OK. Like I said, this is more of the advanced stuff. But yeah, just get rid of what you don't need. In my case, you can do it in one swoop or just slowly. Uh oh, I got rid of the wrong side. That's OK. We will go back to our select tool. Right click. Oh, oh sorry, select tool right click select inverse again already had it right? but of course make sure that I erase from the sky don't need that piece don't need that and I can even deselect now and check it out so of course turn everything back on it's looking like a TV screen up there so I don't know maybe a, a bit too much what could I do I could definitely take it back a little bit right, and make it very subtle that can be a really nice useful tool maybe I want to add some shine to it I can go back to the glass I can sort of erase a hot spot from it well that's a harsh eraser let's go with maybe something more like a zero hardness and give it a highlight spot there's a lot you can do right we can even go full-scale anime you know specular highlight you know what I'm talking about so I mean the the, the possibilities are endless with this however again Keep in mind, this is all advanced stuff, guys. You're not required to do it for our project. However, if you've already found yourself at a really good spot, maybe try this at least on one your own. You know, whether it be just an elevation, maybe a two-point perspective, maybe it's adding a little class or a shadow or some other quality, maybe it's a floor. Maybe you have some somewhat of an actual deck at the top floor. Go look at that, right? And don't make it hyper-realistic. Keep in mind that it still looks like that no more drawing. But once I point that out, people are, are slightly confused in a good way. Right? They both need to look finished, but at the same time, some, some ideas and qualities about it are finished. Right? Again, definitely an example of a hybrid drawing. There's some from analog, and of course, I think they digital. And it, it's really fun when it goes back and forth and switch it. Right? When they print something digital, and they uh, draft on it and then scan it and then photoshop it again. You'd be surprised how many sandwiches and layers this process can really go. And I find it to be 
kind of unique in that somebody can really make it their own through taking it through that workflow, if that makes sense. Um, and again, what's kind of nice is none of these programs really were designed for architecture. Rhino wasn't designed for architecture, Illustrator wasn't designed for architecture, Photoshop wasn't designed for architecture, and yet we have the ability to use it, and in some ways that changed the industry so badly that other fields even also use it now, especially like laser cutters and things like that. Um, anyway, that'll conclude at least um, maybe an introduction to Photoshop. Uh, just to kind of recap, we just talked about curves, layers, and photo merge, right? Really that's kind of what's required for the composition. Um, and then kind of the extras, some of the, the commands are the magic wand tool, lasso tool, that's about it. Any questions, guys? Any at all? Fair enough? Hopefully something new? for the most part. Good. I'll leave it there. <laughs>